Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on the quantitative methodology chapter. And just before we get started with the presentation today, I'd like to present this information in case you're interested in additional support outside of this webinar. So we do provide assistance with all aspects of the dissertation. So if you are interested in more one-on-one -on -one support outside of this webinar, you can use the information that you see here to contact us and learn more about the different types of assistance that we provide. First, just to give an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, this presentation is on the quantitative methodology chapter. So we will not be covering uh, information about qualitative methods today. If you are interested in qualitative methods, then we do have other webinars uh, that cover that topic. So today we will be focusing on quantitative. We'll first talk about the purpose and importance of the methodology chapter to the dissertation. And then most of the presentation will be on the different components that are required in the chapter. So this will include the introduction, research design, discussions of the population and sample, instrumentation, data collection and analysis, procedures, limitations, and ethical considerations. And then at the end, we'll have an opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you do have a question, um, about the content during the presentation, you can feel free to type that into the questions section. And then any questions that aren't answered during the course of the presentation, I'll do my best to answer those questions uh, at the end. So first let's talk about the purpose of the methodology chapter. So the methodology chapter is to describe how you are going to be conducting your research. The previous chapters of the dissertation, so namely the introduction and literature review chapters, are designed to establish why you need to conduct your research. So in those chapters, you're establishing the need for your research and why the research needs to be done. Once you get to the methodology chapter, it's time to start describing how you're going to carry out the research. So if you have a specific research purpose, or specific research questions or hypotheses that you set out to answer, then the methodology chapter is going to describe what you are going to do to conduct the research and answer those questions. And the important thing to keep in mind throughout the methodology chapter and as you work on the methodology chapter is that this chapter should be detailed enough so that your research can be replicated by others. The idea is that you want your descriptions and your presentation of the methodology to be detailed enough so that someone could read your chapter and be able to conduct the research in exactly the same way that you will be conducting it. So you can think of the methodology chapter almost like an instruction manual. So you are writing the instructions for how to conduct your research study. Other people will liken the methodology chapter to a recipe where you may have different ingredients or components like the participants, the, the research instruments, and then you have to provide the steps for how to put all of those components together. And one thing keep, to keep in mind as well is Although this presentation will be covering the sections that are most typical for methodology chapters, given our experience with many different schools, you should still check your specific school or degree program guidelines to determine what is required for your methodology chapter. So every school will have different guidelines. Uh, some schools uh, may not have specific guidelines for what needs to go in the chapter. Some schools will have very specific guidelines for what needs to go in the chapter. They may require more sections than what we present here. They may require a few sections or they may require the sections to be organized in a different way. So make sure that you defer to your school's guidelines as you are writing your methodology chapter. So now let's start talking about the components of the chapter. And like most other chapters in the dissertation, the methodology chapter 
to begin with a short introduction where you reorient your reader to the problem and purpose of the study and restate your research questions and hypotheses if they haven't been stated in the paper already, and then preview the uh, sections that will appear in the chapter. So you can start by just restating your problem and purpose statement, and this can either be a verbatim uh, restatement of your problem and purpose from your earlier chapters, um, or it can be an abbreviated version of your purpose statement. And then you want to state your research questions and hypotheses, and these should be stated verbatim the exact same way as they appear in other chapters of your dissertation. It's important that you know, wherever your research questions and hypotheses appear in your document, that they are written exactly the same way each time that they appear. And then you can preview the sections of the chapter, and this could be as simple as just listing out the different section headings that will appear in the chapter. Then one of the first things that you talk about in the methodology chapter is the selection rationale for the research design. So in this section, you want to identify the research design that you've chosen and explain why you chose that design. It's also important to note that depending on your school's guidelines, you may also be required to justify the more general research method, which in this case would be quantitative. Um, so the general research method would be quantitative as opposed to qualitative or mixed method. And then um, from there, you can discuss the more specific research design. Um, depending on your specific degree program or school, you may only need to talk about the design, especially if it's assumed that in your degree program, you will be doing a quantitative study. Uh, but some schools may also you require, to, or require you to discuss the more general research method. But for the design, you first want to state the research design that you've selected. So this under quantitative designs, this could be a correlational design, an experimental design, quasi-experimental design, or a causal comparative design. So those are just some examples of common uh, quantitative designs. And then you want to explain why you selected this design. So why was this the most appropriate design for your study? So for instance, if you're doing a correlational study, maybe you picked a correlational study because your problem purpose and research questions involve looking at the relationships between variables. And that is how you should justify your selection of the design. It should be justified in terms of your problem purpose, research questions, and hypotheses. So those things should be aligned. And then, in addition to explaining why you think your chosen design is the uh, most appropriate design for your study and relating that to your problem, purpose, and research questions, you also want to identify other types of designs that could have been used, but you did not select because they were less appropriate. So for instance, if you picked a correlational design for your study, you'll want to explain why you did not pick an experimental design or why you didn't pick a quasi-experimental design. So for example, if you are doing a correlational study because you're looking at relationships between variables, you probably didn't pick experimental because you know, maybe you can't uh, manipulate the independent variable that you're looking at. Maybe you can't randomly assign participants to conditions or maybe the purpose of your study doesn't involve comparing groups um, or comparing conditions. So those would be reasons why you might uh, decide against choosing those other designs. And again, if you are required to also talk about the more general research method, so your justification for choosing a quantitative method, you would go about it in the same way. So you would start by identifying that you're doing a quantitative uh, method. You would want to explain why you chose a quantitative method. And then you'd also want to explain reasons why you did not choose 
a, a qualitative or a mixed method. So now let's talk about the population and the sample. And this is an area where students can sometimes get confused uh, because sometimes students will use these terms interchangeably. And they might not uh, quite understand the difference between the population and sample, but it's an important distinction to make. So for the population, when we talk about the population, this is the broad group of individuals or people that your results are intended to generalize to. So it's the larger group of people that your study is about. So for example, let's say we're doing a study in education uh, and specifically you're doing a study on teachers. So maybe your uh, population of interest would be teachers of some kind. Um, it might be more specific than just teachers in general. Maybe it's high school teachers, maybe it's elementary school teachers, or maybe it's university professors. Um, maybe it's teachers in a specific subject matter like math or, or science or English. So that might be your more general population. So it could be something like you know, high school teachers in the United States. Um, if you're doing a study on high school teachers. So that would be your general population. And in this section, you want to identify and state the population of interest. So you would state, you know, the population that I'm studying is high school teachers in the United States. And then if possible, you want to describe the characteristics of the population and provide an estimate of the population size. So if you're doing this study on high school teachers in the United States, you want to provide an estimate of how many high school teachers are there in the United States. And you might get this information from some source like the Bureau of Labor Statistics or some other organization that might keep track of statistics on uh, these types of, of populations. So if you're able to get that information, you want to provide that estimate of the population size and if possible other like maybe demographic breakdowns of um, the population. So for instance, among high school teachers, you know, what's the, um, what's the gender distribution among high school teachers? Like what's the percentage of males and females of high school teachers in the population? So the population is different from the sample in that the sample is just those individuals that are selected from the population who will participate in your study. So in other words, the sample are only those people who are participating in your study. They're the people that you are selecting from the population to participate or to participate. So the sample is a subset of the population. And so you can think of the difference between the sample and the population in terms of an analogy uh, with fishing. So let's say that you're planning a fishing trip and you're planning to go to a, a lake to go fishing one day. And when you go to the lake to go fishing, chances are you're not gonna catch every single fish in that lake. Uh, if you're lucky, you might catch a couple of fish that day. So you can think of the population as being all of the fish in the lake, and then your sample is just the fish that you managed to catch that day when you go fishing. And for your sample section, you will want to describe your specific sampling strategy or technique. Um, there are two general approaches to sampling, which would be random or probability sampling and then uh, non-probability sampling. Uh, random sampling means that you are picking individuals from the population completely at random. And this would imply that every individual in the population has an equal opportunity to be selected into your study. However, for a dissertation study, it's unlikely that you'll be able to use a true random sampling uh, technique. Usually um, that's not, it's not feasible or practical to use true random sampling of the entire population. Uh, 
and something like a dissertation study. So for example, if we are doing that study on high school teachers in the United States, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to conduct a true random sample of all the high school teachers in the United States. Um, you, you just won't have access to that full population. There's, um, there's really no way you're gonna be able to, to have access to all of those individuals to invite them to participate. So what's more likely is that you're gonna use some kind of non-probability uh, or convenient sample, which just means that you are sampling from a subset of the population that is available to you. So in the example of high school teachers, you know, maybe you can't sample from all of the high school teachers in the United States. Maybe you can sample from uh, a couple of local high schools that are close to you that you are able to access. Or maybe um, you can access high school teachers through some kind of you know, online or uh, like association for teachers um, or you know, an online group for teachers that high school teachers may be members of and contact that group and see if you can invite their members to participate in your study. So that might be another form of a convenience sample. Whatever sampling technique or strategy you choose, you want to describe in a lot of detail how exactly you're going to identify participants from the population and invite them to participate in your study. So again, with looking at a, our example with high school teachers, you know, are you going to identify them by you know, just looking at a couple of local high schools and then going into those high schools and recruiting teachers from there? Um, are you going to get in touch with the principals and then the principals are going to give you the contact information for those teachers? Or are you going to go the route of uh, looking at some kind of teacher group or association that high school teachers are members of and contacting the uh, administrators of that group and seeing if you can get the member contact information to invite those people into your study? So you just wanna be as detailed as possible about how you are going to go about uh, recruiting those people from the population. And another thing that you'll want to include in the sample section is a calculation for your target sample size. So in a quantitative study, your sample size estimate will be based on uh, most likely a power analysis. So the power analysis is used to estimate sample size based on the type of statistical analysis that you plan to conduct. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot more detail about power analysis in this presentation because we do have other webinars that specifically focus on power analysis and sample size calculation. So if you're more interested in that topic, then I would uh, direct you to those more specific webinars on power analysis. So now, next let's talk about the instrumentation. And so the instrumentation are the means by which you are measuring the variables in your study. So in the instrumentation section, you should identify an instrument to measure each variable that you list out in your problem, purpose, and research questions. And instruments can take many different forms. Uh, if we're doing you know, research in the social sciences, a lot of times instruments will be things like survey instruments. So participants might fill out a survey and answer questions that assess their, their self-esteem or their self-efficacy or their level of anxiety or job satisfaction. So survey instruments would be an example of a type of instrument, but not all instruments are, are survey instruments. There are other types of instruments too. So um, if you're doing something more along the lines of um, biomedical research, uh, maybe you're taking measurements of things like height and, and weight or, or blood pressure, 
there are specific devices or instruments that measure those things. So there are blood pressure monitors, there are scales that can measure weight uh, and so on. So those would be instruments too. But for the purposes of the rest of our discussion, we'll be focusing more on survey type instruments. So in this section, you'll want to state the instrument that you're using to measure each variable. So each variable should have an instrument that measures it. And for each instrument, you will want to describe the details of that instrument. So again, if it's a survey instrument, how many items or questions does it have? So maybe you're measuring depression with you know, a 10 item or 10 question instrument. And then what is the response scale and scoring of that instrument? So how are participants responding to the items? Are they responding using a Likert type scale where they rate it on a scale one to five or one to seven that ranges from you know, strongly disagree to strongly agree? Or are they using some other type of um, response scale? And then how is that instrument scored? So if you have an instrument that has 10 questions in it um, to measure a certain variable, how are you going to score those 10 questions to get the, the final measurement of your variable that you're going to be using in your analysis? So are you just going to take the average of the 10 items? Are you going to sum the 10 items together to get a total score? Or are you going to be scoring the... Uh, items in some other way. And usually the instrument that you're using may have instructions for how the, the items should be scored. And also for each instrument, you want to discuss the validity and reliability of the instrument. And specifically for survey instruments, the validity would be um, something like the results of a factor analysis. And then for reliability, evidence for, li for reliability would be the results of, say, a Cronbach's alpha analysis or a Cronbach's alpha coefficient, or maybe a test-retest correlation. And so those are all statistics that you can usually find in the article that describes how the instrument was originally created and developed. And so in that original article, so the very first article that uh, talks about the instrument is where you would usually find all of the statistical tests that were done uh, to establish initial evidence for validity and reliability. So that's where you would find that information. And you wanna ta uh, take that information from the article and report it um, in your instrumentation section as evidence for the instrument's validity and reliability. And it's also worth noting that some schools may have a completely separate section for validity and reliability um, where they want you to put this information, uh, but other schools may just want you to report this information in the instrumentation section. So now we can talk about data collection procedures. And this is one of the most important sections of the methodology because here is where you're going to be giving you step-by-step -step instructions and details on how the data are going to be collected. And again, you should approach this section with the mindset that should be detailed enough so that someone else could read this and be able to carry out the study in the exact same way that you are going to carry it out. And so you want to include details in this section, such as where and how the data collection is going to take place. So if you're doing some kind of survey study, for instance, are you going to be doing the survey in person? So going back to our example with the high school teachers, are you going to be going into the schools and handing out a paper and pencil survey to the teachers for them to fill out? or are you going to be doing the survey online? So maybe you're just going to put your survey online and then send an email to your participants that has a link to the survey and then they can complete the, the survey online from their own computer on their own time. So you'll want to describe that process. 
uh, you'll want to describe how participants provide uh, informed consent. So informed consent is an important part of the process where participants are given information about the study so that they can make an informed decision to participate. And so if you're doing something like an online survey study, you usually present the consent form as the first page of your survey so participants can read information about the study and then make a decision about whether or not they wanna continue uh, answering the questions. If you're doing an in-person study, uh, you'll, the, the very first thing you usually do is give the participant a consent form that explains all the details of the study. And then if they agree to participate, they will sign that consent form. You also want to talk about how and when each instrument is going to be administered. And this is especially important if you're doing something uh, or a study that involves repeated measurements or a longitudinal study where you are administering um, your instruments or, or questions uh, at more than one point in time. So you want to be specific about you know, how many times each instrument will be completed and when each instrument will be completed and the order in which the instruments will be completed. And I will note that up until this point, we've been mainly talking about primary data collection. So uh, that would mean data collection where you are actually um, collecting the data yourself from participants, but it's also possible to do studies on pre-existing data, um, which is also called uh, secondary or archival data. So it's possible you may be doing your dissertation using uh, data that already exists. And so in your data collection procedures, what you talk about here is going to be a little bit different than if you were collecting primary data. If you're doing a study on secondary data, uh, instead of talking about how the, the data are going to be collected because the data are already are collected, instead you wanna talk about how you are going to access the data. So are the data available um, publicly? Uh, are they just available on some website where anyone can go to the website and download and use the data? Or are the data held by some kind of organization or administer um, who you have to get in contact with and get permission from in order to access and use the data. So if you're using secondary data, you want to describe that whole process of how you are identifying the, the data that you're going to use and how you're going to get access to those data. And so after you go through your data collection procedures, which should basically detail everything that will happen in the study up through when you get IRB approval until your data are collected and ready to analyze, then you can start talking about your data analysis plan. So in addition to talking about how the data are going to be collected, you also need a plan for how you're going to analyze that data to answer your research questions. And so in the data analysis plan, you will lay out exactly what analyses you are going to perform to answer each research question or hypothesis. And first, you want to describe how the data are going to be compiled or entered into an electronic format. And this is especially important if you are doing something like paper and pencil surveys that um, aren't originally completed uh, in electronic form and need to be entered um, into an electronic form. So you want to describe that process. You'll wanna state the software that you're going to use uh, for in data cleaning and analysis. So you might use software like SPSS or we have our own software in elective statistics. And then you want to describe how you are going to clean or prepare the data for the analysis. So this can involve you know, checking the data for uh, missing values, uh, coding or recoding any of the data. Um, if anything needs to be recoded, like for instance, you know, some items in your survey may need to be reverse coded if there are any negatively worded items. And you also want to describe how your uh, 
data are going to be scored. Again, if you have survey questions that need to be you know, averaged or summed into composite scores um, in order to compute the variables that you're going to use in the analysis, you want to describe that process. And in particular, for missing data, um, you need to describe how you are going to deal with any uh, missing responses. So especially if you're doing something like a survey study, it is very likely that uh, you're going to have some missing data. Um, participants will either uh, you know, skip some questions or they may skip entire sections of the survey or they may decide uh, halfway through the survey that they um, want to, to quit and not answer any more questions. So you're likely going to have to deal with missing data of some kind, and you're going to need a plan for how you're going to deal with that. So are you just going to completely exclude any participant that is missing any data? Or are you going to try to keep participants who are missing data? And if so, how are you going to deal with the missing values? Are you going to try to impute or replace the values that are missing um, in some way? Or are you going to deal with the missing data in some other way, such as just doing a pairwise um, exclusion? So you'll want to describe that process. And then you want to describe or state any descriptive statistics that you're going to conduct on the variables. So you might present descriptives for any demographic information that you collect, just so that you can characterize your sample, as well as provide descriptive statistics for all of your study variables. So all the variables listed in your research questions and hypotheses. And so you'd probably do frequencies and percentages for uh, categorical variables and means and standard deviations for uh, any continuous variables that you are using. And then you want to describe the analysis that you're going to use to answer each research question and hypothesis. So you can do this section just in order of your research questions and for each research question state what analysis you plan to do. So for instance, if you're doing, uh, or if you have a question that's about relationships between variables, maybe you're going to do something like a Pearson correlation or maybe uh, a regression of some kind. If your research question is about comparing groups, then maybe you're gonna do some kind of a t-test or an ANOVA. So whatever the research question is, you want to state what analysis you're going to use to answer that research question and justify um, why you're using that analysis to answer the research question. You'll want to you know, state what variables are going to be involved in each analysis. So you'll want to identify your, your independent and dependent variables, or if you're doing something like a, a regression, your uh, predictor and criterion variables. And then for each analysis, you'll want to describe the assumptions of that analysis. So pretty much any analysis will have certain statistical assumptions that need to be tested. Um, so for instance, if you're doing something like a t-test or an ANOVA, you may need to test the assumptions of normality and homogeneity of variance. And so for those tests, you want to describe how you're going to test those assumptions. So how are you going to test normality? How are you going to test homogeneity of variance? So for normality, you might do something like a Shapiro-Wilk test, or you might look at histograms, or you might look at skewness and kurtosis values, or you might use a combination of those things to assess normality. And then if any of those assumptions are violated, you want to have a plan set out for what you're going to do if those assumptions are violated. So for instance, maybe if the assumptions of the t-test are violated, you may do a, a non-parametric version of the t-test instead, or maybe you'll try to transform the variables so that they are normally distributed if normality happens to be violated.
So you'll want to include a plan for what you're going to do if you encounter any violations of the assumptions. So next, let's talk about the limitations. And so some schools will require you to talk about limitations in the methodology section. And this may be a little different from limitations that you discuss earlier in your dissertation. The limitations in the methodology section are limitations that are specific to your research design or your study procedures. So you'll want to list out um, any limitations that are relevant to your study design or the specific procedures that you are following for your research. And different quantitative designs will have different uh, limitations associated with them. So for instance, in correlational studies, the main limitation of correlational study is that we can't determine cause and effect from a correlational research. If you're using some kind of a survey method, then a limitation might be various types of response biases like social desirability bias. If you are doing any kind of like pre and post test study or a longitudinal study, you may have limitations based on attrition or testing effects or history or maturation. Those are all things that can affect uh, a longitudinal or a pre versus post study. And then if you're doing experimental research, your limitations might involve discussion of external validity, which is the degree to which your results can generalize to context outside of the experiment. And then usually one of the last sections of the methodology chapter is the discussion of the ethical considerations. And so this is where you just want to talk about ethical issues that are relevant to your study and how you're going to ensure that you conduct the study in an ethical manner and protect your participants. So the ethical considerations often involves discussion of the Belmont Report principles, which are principles that are set out um, that researchers should follow uh, in order to uh, protect participants and conduct ethical research. And the primary principles of the Belmont Report include beneficence, justice, and respect for persons. And so a lot of times schools will want you to list out these principles specifically and discuss how you plan to uphold each principle in your research. You'll wanna talk about how your study is going to need institutional review board or IRB approval. So you know, virtually all research will uh, require approval from an institutional review board. So you'll want to mention that process. You'll want to talk about how participants are going to provide informed consent. You might talk about a little bit in your uh, earlier sections in your data collection procedures, but you can also talk about it here in the ethical considerations and talk about how um, you will be providing the consent form to participants to inform them about um, the study so that they can make an informed choice about whether they uh, should participate or not. You know, usually part of that consent form is informing participants about the risks involved in the study. And some students will make the mistake of saying that their study doesn't involve any risk or that there's no risk in the study. But that's not really true because all research involves some kind of risk. It's just that some research involves only minimal risk or what we would say is minimal. So usually something like an online survey study uh, would be a, a minimal risk study because the risks associated with participation uh, wouldn't be any greater than what participants may encounter in just their you know, normal everyday lives. That's what we mean by minimal risk. But perhaps you're doing a study that involves more than minimal risk. And that would mean that there's a chance of you know, physical, emotional, or psychological discomfort or harm that's greater than what participants would normally encounter in their everyday lives. So maybe it's some kind of medical study where participants could encounter some kind of physical harm. Uh, 
or maybe it's a study on some kind of a, a sensitive topic um, that could cause participants uh, emotional or psychological distress from answering uh, questions about a sensitive topic. So if there are more than minimal risks involved in your study, you want to discuss specifically what those risks are and what you're going to be doing to deal with and mitigate those risks in order to protect your participants. And in any study, you wanna talk about how participants' identities and information are going to be protected. So anytime you collect information from participants, whether it's identifiable or not, you need a plan for how you are going to protect that information. So are you going to be collecting any personally identifying information? And if so, how are you going to keep that uh, information confidential? Or maybe you're going to be conducting your study anonymously and not collecting personally identifying information. But for the data that you do collect, how are you going to keep that secure? Uh, if you're doing an online survey study, for instance, are you just going to be storing the data uh, in encrypted cloud storage? Or are you going to be storing it on a password protected computer? If you're collecting paper and pencil data, like a paper and pencil survey, what are you going to do with the paper and pencil uh, or physical copies of the survey? So are you going to keep it uh, in a secure location, like a locked office and a locked filing cabinet somewhere. So you want to be specific about how you're going to protect those data. And then you also want to talk about how the data are going to be disposed of or destroyed after the study is over. So schools will usually have guidelines for how long you should keep the data after your study has concluded. So it might be, you know, something like two years or three years or five years that they want you to preserve the data. And then after that period is over, you should destroy the data and you will just want to outline the specific procedures that you're going to follow for disposing of the data. And so that brings us to the end of the presentation on the components of the quantitative methodology chapter. So again, if you're interested in additional support outside of this webinar, then you can use the information that you see here to contact us to learn uh, more about the services that we offer. And so now I will get into the question portion of the uh, webinar. So if you do have a question, you can feel free to type that into the question section now and I'll do my best to answer your questions. And so I'll go ahead and see what questions that we have already. And so one question is, can you show an example of how you do a factor analysis using SPSS. Unfortunately, that's kind of outside the scope of what we cover in this particular webinar because this is more focused on the components of what goes into the methodology chapter rather than the details of data analysis itself. We do have other webinars that cover um, data analysis and things like data management and SPSS if you're interested in those topics. But if you want to know specifically like how to conduct a factor analysis in SPSS, then um, you may want to look into more one-on-one -on -one help that we provide in terms of um, you know, showing you how to conduct a factor analysis. Another question is, if you have a few questions using Likert scales, do you do a Cronbach's alpha uh, for each or on all questions at the, the same time? So again, this is more of a, a, a question specifically about data analysis, but the short answer is a Cronbach's alpha measures the reliability of a set of items. So for instance, if you have a measure of a depression that consists of 10 items, the Cronbach's alpha would be computed for those 10 items to give you a reliability coefficient that tells you um, how consistently participants answered that set of 10 questions. 
another question is, if your participants are patients in a doctor's office, they start the survey but have to stop to see the doc, they come back and finish the survey afterwards, is it okay? And do you have to state that um, in part of the, the methodology? So, you know, in terms of whether or not that's okay, I'd probably need more context about like the, the nature of the, the study and um, you know, what the questions are about and what the exact procedures were. And really you're, when you go up for um, ethical review for the institutional review board, uh, they would give you feedback on whether or not um, an event like that would be acceptable. But you do want to, for the second part of the question, do you have to state that in part of the methodology? Um, in your methodology, you do want to just be as detailed as possible in terms of the procedures that you're going to follow for the data collection. So, you know, if you're going into the doctor's office um, to give people surveys, you want to be as detailed as possible about how that process is going to work. Like, are you just going to, you know, show up in the doctor's office probably with permission um, from the, um, you know, the, the office managers in that doctor's office um, to, to be there in the office and maybe you know, ask people who come in if they want to participate in your study. So you want to be very detailed about like that whole process. And let's see if we have other questions. So the question is, the risk with ret retrospective chart review is minimal. Uh, again, it would depend kind of on the specifics of your study. I would think that in, in most cases, um, the risk of a, in a retrospective chart review would be minim minimal because the main risks would be, um, you know, if the the information that you are pulling uh, is is compromised, like if somebody else other than than you or the people who are approved to to see it in the research got access to it, um, those would be the main risks because you're not at that point, you know, actually doing any medical procedures yourself that would involve any physical risk. Um, the main risks involved in that would be uh, risks surrounding participants' information and if, per, if in, the possibility for information to be uh, leaked or compromised or anything like that. And those are usually considered more, more minimal risks. Another question is, when would a power analysis not be needed? Uh, if usually power analysis is needed if you're doing any kind of inferential analysis, which would cover most quantitative research. But for instance, if you were doing um, a purely descriptive study where you're not doing any kind of infer inferential analysis, so you know, you're not doing t-tests, you're not doing ANOVA, you're not doing any correlations or regressions, you're just presenting descriptive statistics, there's no power analysis for descriptive statistics. Um, people may still want you to estimate a sample size for descriptive statistics, and that may be more based on um, the, the population size. So there are certain you know, sample size calculators that may be based on population size, or if you're trying to uh, report a descriptive statistic with a certain um, margin of error. So if you, you can think of like uh, election polls where they do a poll um, and present the, uh, the results of the poll uh, with a certain margin of error. Your sample size has to be um, a certain amount in order to achieve a certain margin of error, um, even for descriptive statistics like um, you know, polling results. So those would be examples where you may not necessarily need to do a power analysis, but you may still need to um, provide some kind of justification for a, a sample size relevant to the types of statistics that you plan to present. 
And then another question is, how can I choose a percentage of sample if I do not know the population? So you may not know, for instance, how many um, people there are or individuals there are exactly in your, your population. Going back to our discussion earlier, it's good to have uh, a general estimate of what the population size might be, but it's, it's very possible that you can't get that exact number. So you may not be able to say exactly, you know, what percentage of your population your, your sample size ends up being. But in terms of estimating your sample size, if you're doing some kind of an inferential analysis, which you know, most quantitative studies would involve, so if you're doing something like a correlation or a t-test or an ANOVA or any analysis like that, the sample size is going to be based on power analysis, which um, does not depend on the population size. So you don't, you don't need to know anything about the size of the population to, to do a power analysis and get a, a sample size estimate for that. Again, if you're doing more descriptive research, um, one way that people will sometimes choose um, sample size is based on a percentage of the, the population, or it may be based on a population size, or um, it can be based on a raw number, again, for something like polling statistics, where you have to compute a certain margin of error, you need a certain you know, number of participants in order to achieve a certain margin of error. And that's um, sometimes irrespective of the actual population size. So um, basically the gist of that is, if you don't know the exact population size, it's okay. Um, you usually do want to try to estimate what it is as best as you can, but if you don't know the exact number of the population and don't know exactly what percentage of the population your sample is going to be, um, that doesn't really matter too much because your sample size is usually computed based on power analysis. So it looks like those are all the questions that have been asked so far. So if anyone has any additional questions, you can go ahead and enter those into the questions section now. I'll give another minute or so um, for any other questions to come in. All right, doesn't look like any other questions are being submitted. So I'll go ahead and end the presentation uh, there for today. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. And again, if you're interested in more one-on-one -on -one support, you can use the information on the screen now to contact us and learn more about how we can assist you. We also do have webinars on other topics. So you're interested in more of um, our free webinars on uh, other topics of the dissertation. You can take a look at our list of webinars and see what other presentations we're doing. But again, thanks everyone for attending today. I hope you found it useful and I hope everyone has a great day.